Hello, everybody. Welcome to the State of Mind podcast, where we create space for conversations about mental health that change lives by bringing you the stories underneath the slogans. We want people to learn that they're empowered by their experience, not inhibited. My name is Mike Stroh. I'm the founder of Starts With Me, a consultancy that specializes in K-12 education and workplace mental health. I am a psychotherapist and I'm passionate about all things mental health and well-being. On today's episode, we have Sean Rabel. He is the principal consultant and founder of Game Plan Total Rewards Consulting, providing strategic consulting, training, and project management services around total rewards, HR systems operations, and workplace mental health programs. Sean is passionate about impacting mental health in the workplace through his Change One Life Four Pillars strategy, which brings practical solutions with proven return on investment. Sean brings 20 years of total rewards HR business experience working in several industries, retail, aviation, financial services, consumer products, high tech, construction, industrial, telecom, resources, and transportation, including global experience across 30 countries. He understands what drives a business and the profit and loss behind it. On this episode, Sean and I get into a little bit of the history behind human resources and the growth of the need to take care of workers or people within a business or within an industry. Sean has a lot of insight into the different processes that go on behind the scenes, how decisions are made in the corporate offices, how human resources help implement policies that support people. And he just shares a lot of great insight into the dynamics of human interaction in a workplace and how all these things impact the bottom line, how we can prove that taking care of people is good for business. Who would have thought such a thing could be possible? So Sean really does a great job illuminating our eyes and minds to that concept and a lot of good ideas and insights into what current workplaces are doing to help bring that about. As I continue to try to do on the podcast, it's weave together this story of our internal personal psychology, what goes on inside each and every one of our heads and hearts, and how that is directly correlated to the world outside of us. Too often we kind of point around and say, if that was just better, I would feel better. If only other people would do X, my life would be better. There's a kernel of truth to that, but we need to look in the mirror more often and we need to reflect on how others are similar to us and how if we can kind of internalize our own experience, that's a much more empowered place to be to take action in the world. Please share, comment, like, subscribe. And if you want free tickets to our upcoming State of Mind Festival, which is just about a week away, please email mike at startswithme.ca. Tell me you heard me say this on the podcast and I will send you tickets. Okay, without further ado, I bring you Sean Rabel. Okay, hi, Sean. And thank you so much for joining me here. And can you please um, tell everybody a bit about yourself, how you got here and what you're up to? All right. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever people are listening to this. Uh, I'm Sean. I'm in uh, Vancouver, and uh, BC. Um, so I am, I'm an independent consultant uh, in HR, focusing on uh, total rewards like compensation benefits, uh, HR systems, and then my uh, area of most passion and favorite is mental health. Um, so I've been in HR for about almost oh, over 20 years now and uh, grew up uh, kind of growing through different organizations and different industries um, from retail to financial services to aviation to you know high tech, uh, consumer products um, and, and done some global work as well. So supported over 30 countries, uh, one organization had over 30 collective agreements, so very familiar with the union space. 
and um, you know that's that's really so with about a year and a bit ago I started uh, my own consulting practice uh, game plan and uh, supporting those three areas and uh, it's been a wild ride uh, started it right before the pandemic so it was uh, all excited had a couple clients and then March 15th hit just about a year ago today and lost all all my uh, contracts and uh, as many independent consultants uh, went through the same and uh, the what was great was though it started giving me some focus on other parts of my life as well and to the mental health part of my business started to grow right and so there was a, more reach outs and that was uh, a blessing to be able to have the time to focus on on my message and reaching out to new audiences in Canada and, and even globally which is great because of my global work um, so we've been done work for folks in was the U.S., but in India, across Europe, Asia, and it's been uh, it's been pretty, pretty incredible ride. So thank you. Glad to be here today. So thanks. Yeah, that's that. It has been a wild year. It's uh, interesting you say about India because actually India, most the most downloads for my podcast come from India. Oh. which is pretty remarkable. So if you're in India right now listening to this, I really just started exploring these things recently. Yeah. So hello, everybody in India <laughs> who's listening. I'm amazed that you're listening and thank you so much. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, yeah, it is very cool. Um, I, I Actually, one thing as you were speaking that totally came out of left field, I did not think about asking you at all, but I'm very <laughs> curious how so you've been in HR for a long time. You've worked in so many different domains yeah my thought was uh because you also mentioned unions and i think anyway the thought was around the evolution of i guess organ like workplace businesses industry organizational yeah. uh psychology i guess or or people management um yeah true yeah i guess i'm just curious how HR fits in that mm. timeline? I don't even know if that's the right question to ask, but do you get I think a sense I know, of what yeah, I Yeah, I guess. <laughs> so I mean, from, from my seat, kind of growing up in HR um, and seeing different organizations, the view of human resources, you know, in terms of strategically, you know, um, and looking at ha HR having a voice at the strategic table, right, with a, a C-suite, um, and depending on the organization, of course, there's variances, but it's becoming more and more prevalent that you see um, CHROs, that you see that there are C-suite roles dedicated to the people, right, to the human resource function, um, that they are strategic arm, right, versus 20 years ago, when I was you know, even further back, but for me, um, depending on what organization you were in, there was less. Like, HR didn't always have a voice at the table. It was the personnel department. Um, so there's been a shift in terms of um, how, and definitely in the last few years, it's just, you know, with new generations coming to the workforce, uh, this gig economy, you know, short-term contracts, the things are shifting, technology. So the demands for organizations to look at the human side of, of people, of employees, of all the workers that are related to that organization, how are, how are they feeling about that relationship, right? And so we've always had mental health issues and concerns about burnout and do more with less, do more with less. It's been the common thing for many organizations, but now the, the awareness, the enlightenment that's happening and going, you know what, if we don't do something about this, we, we should have been doing something about this a long time ago, talking about diversity, inclusion, and equity, talking about mental health in the workplace. How, what does true authentic leadership mean and humility in that, that we are all human beings trying to do our best in this world and be part of something. Um, it's it's got a, a bigger voice and there's more organizations starting to pay attention to it and actually starting to take um, action, which is great. So yeah, definitely seen a lot of shift of the HR function uh, in the last 20 years for sure. And every organization, every industry is a little bit different. Um, so there's nuances, but generally it's obviously uh, grown and significant, so. And just, uh, I think I figured it out as you were talking, but <laughs> is CHRO chief human resources officer? You got it. Yeah. Right on. No, right you'll, on. You'll, see, you'll see like chief people officer, CPO, or chief, there's right, chief right, diversity right, right. officers now. And uh, yeah, it's, right. yeah. 
you got it. <laughs> a lot of acronyms. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Stop me Thank whenever you. I do it. That's I'm happy to spell it out too. Okay, I will. I will. Um, and and C suite, I guess. What's that corporate? Like, what is what is yeah, the like, definition of a C suite? Like, yeah, it's kind of your your chief officer. So C suite, C for chief. So it's all your uh, chief financial officer, chief HR okay. officer, okay. chief right. operator. Right. Yeah, it's kind of that right. top of the house. So for bigger organizations, they'll have that. Obviously, smaller they they may not, but. Uh, Right. Yeah, that's kind of the term. Right. And 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 so as you put it, like as the demands of a modern workforce uh, society, et cetera, change, yep. that has led to to more focus on the human aspect of the workplace and that kind of thing. Totally exactly. Yeah. People are seeing it right. in terms of connecting the dots between, you know, if you look at absenteeism, productivity, engagement, customer satisfaction, safety records, all, it's all about people, right? And so you can have a great product, but it's the people, right? That actually deliver it, sell it, build it, all that kind of stuff. And so really understanding the metrics and how it all ties together is so important. And organizations that are doing it right are actually understanding that, you know, if we focus on engagement, right, if we focus on the health of our employees, we can actually improve our safety records, improve sales, improve margins, improve customer satisfaction. And you and you see that over time, you look at the stock market of organizations that focus on it versus those that don't, they'll have better results and returns to shareholders. So there are lots of studies that have been done and books written about, um, you know, organization, you know, good to great. There's a few out there that talk about, uh, if an organization puts people first and really understands the dynamic of it, it actually has results um, to the bottom line, to your PL, which is what, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, if we're not running a business and making money, none of us have jobs. So it is <laughs> very important to balance between the human side, the care, right? Culture of care and kindness and all that, with we need to operate our business and make money, right? So that we have jobs. And I've seen that where organizations have had to contract um, and people have great talented individuals have had to leave organizations um, because the organization you know missed the mark or just the, the margins weren't there and so it's really tough right for organizations to find that balance so in human resources we're constantly trying to provide uh, recommendations looking at risk and at the end of the day those owners make the final decisions we can only make recommendations assess risk from all those pieces but what's really important and for me, what I do is how do we connect the HR result, the human results to the, the PL and the financial results? So let's talk about those things together because a healthy organization with healthy people will be around for many years to come, right? And so driving innovation, enlisting those pe the people, uh, the employees into you know how we serve our customers and how do we drive efficiency, like. Let's not do these kind of you know haves and have nots and the the employees versus the, you know this whole ivory tower thing like organizations that flatten these organization structures out and really empower people to bring their best selves they're the ones that are going to be around for a long time and um, those are the ones that are going to attract the best talent and keep the best talent so yeah I, I think i'm getting i'm not sure if you know too much about how and i don't actually uh i do know elon musk and the freak of nature that he is and, and i would say in a good way i mean thank goodness we have people like that in the world um yeah i do know he's very famous for hiring really amazing people and and doing everything he can to keep them happy and engaged and inspired and yeah. and then you just see downstream i mean Tesla as an automobile is so far advanced than any other car that's ever been created. And, you know, some of the, I, I think Porsche maybe is, is catching up in some ways, but yeah, I mean, just miles ahead and yeah. it's one of the most valuable companies in the world. And, and I know for the most part, of course, you always hear bad stories, but people love working for Tesla and then, and then he's got all these other ridiculous companies doing ridiculous things. <laughs> um, but I think yeah. it's a good testament to, it seems that he does really value his employees. And then, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. Do you know much about kind of Tesla or Elon Musk or his whole organization? Well, I mean, a, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, a little bit for sure in terms of um, he's kind of pushing the envelope on things, right? So it's all about innovation, right? And so that organization exists because of innovation. And so the whole right, culture right, right, is right, embedded right. of 
of inviting that talent in and unleashing them into their organizational right. kind of right. portfolio right. of right. products and delivery. So, yeah, and you see that in other other industries. You know, Zappos is a great example where um, the late Tony, uh, the, the founder yeah. and president um, you know, the Happiness Project, and just how he enlisted and changed that culture. The culture was so part of their story and who they were and why they were successful, right? And you, there's all these famous stories of, you know, somebody calling the call center and they're just, they needed help and it wasn't about shoes, right? I mean, it was just, they went the extra mile to support somebody, a customer. And those are those stories that sit and get, and then pass through, you know, from person to person going, now that's an organization where the culture is so loud and vibrant and caring that your customers are seen as people, that they're a whole person, that anybody that's interacting with those customers can interact with them and create a human connection and go above and beyond as much as they, you know, they're, they're allowed to, right? They're, in, they're encouraged to. So it's another example of like bringing innovation and how you, if you really set the culture, um, you can be very successful as an organization, which is what we all and, and all those generally want, I would think. Um, and uh, and it, but it takes it takes courage to bring humility, right? To to operate in that mindset uh, because you have to fall into that. You have to be a vulnerable, authentic leader. You have to bring those leaders and those anybody that's managing people into that fold, right? You've got to. What are you hiring for? Are you hiring for that culture uh, in terms of supporting it? <laughs> And um, being clear on, on your intentions. So I think organizations that say that we are, you know, they put it on the wall, but they don't operate in alignment with those values, um, right. that fractures pretty quickly. So, yeah. That's really interesting. The, um, oh, okay. Um, oh, it, it, how does HR, and I, I don't know if it differs from place to place, I assume it does. Um, does HR have a say in like the salary expectations? So just going down this thought stream, because <laughs> that's a probably a, like, I assume HR is the one who makes the hires most of the time, correct? Is that correct or not well, necessarily? We, well, we support the hiring process. We'll make recommendations and help do the screening, but it's really up to the managers, right? I mean, the managers oh, okay. make the okay. final decision. Right. Right. Um, and HR uh, will support the process and screen candidates to get to a final few generally. That's uh, the approach, yeah. Okay. Um, I think there's something, and I, and I don't know if it's tightly connected to HR or how it all works, but the, yeah. the end, I like that you mentioned this, the idea of serving the customer or consumer, whoever it is. I think one thing that has made me loyal to Apple all these years, and the reason I'm willing to spend more money than it's, the products are probably worth um, is because the customer service has always been world class, and even right. I, I've e lately I've had issues with the customer service, not because the people aren't kind and helpful, but just I'm trying to be empathetic. Nobody's <laughs> thinking clearly. I've got five different opinions from five. You know, it just has been a yeah. disaster. But yeah, I'm able to forgive that in a sense because my my experience has been so good over time. Yep. Um, and I think that speaks to your, this idea of the culture. I think Apple seems to treat their employees well. I don't know. Do you know if they have a reputation for that or what? Yeah. I mean, I know people that work at Apple and speak very highly yeah. of it um, because yeah. it's a it's a company of innovation and, and being successful and and driving, but it's a large organization, right? So you're always going to have pockets that maybe are tougher than others. So um, I would say... Um, but they're known for innovation, right? And so, and they're known for good customer service, part of their brand and why there's a premium to the product pricing is, yeah. is the brand loyalty. There's a, you know, there's a significance, but I have Apple product. Um, they're obviously they're challenged by some competitors even more now than ever, right? So you can see that in, in uh, <laughs> with the Android space and Google and all that. So, but yeah, no, I mean, customer service matters. Like this reminds me of an organization I used to work at where, we spent time focusing on those, like say the contact center that we're dealing with our customers that usually weren't calling a contact center to, to say, it's amazing here. They're calling because there's a concern. There's something that they're upset about. Mm -hmm. but focusing on those frontline reps on terms of A, their mental health, right? How are they supported? 
to that how they interact with those customers who may also be going through stuff too. They're human beings on the other line. So help to, you know, get curious about what's going on and make, not make assumptions about what that customer is going through, asking those right questions, making sure. And so the more we focus on those that interact with our customers to make sure they're okay, right? That they've got the support they need, um, but also then how do they show kindness and, uh, and curiosity uh, to their customers that are calling in, especially in a call center environment where generally the calls are more on the um, a concern or you know maybe a complaint uh, <laughs> something isn't working. So you know it's a very intense uh, type of, of, of role and, and environment. So but focusing on that the mental health and the mindset and the care of that frontline and how that then translates to your customer service, that's huge, and I'm always doing it, but it it really changes the game because that customer like, oh wow, like they actually care, like they they ask a few other questions, and you know, mm -hmm. so it, that connection, and that's what what you remember forever, right? So if if you it's these stories that have a heart to it and emotion that then pass on, right? And so you think about, you know, you tell me a fact and I'll learn. You tell me a, you know, it, but if you tell me a story, it'll stay in my heart forever, right? And that's why the power of story is so important in terms of when we create an amazing moment in these little micro moments that are happening all the time between people, humans, and in business, it's those magical moments that we capture that's part of our story, that's part of the archive of who we are. We show up and we're selling products and services, but it's in all those moments that matter that make us feel like, wow, we had a great day today. We helped these people. And when they talked to their families, I had a great holiday that got everything solved. It's amazing. I'm gonna tell somebody. That's the best marketing you can get. Right, and so it's worth the, the the ROI is there, and there's organizations that have proven it time and time again by investing in that piece um, has has incredible ripple effect uh, and and positive impact to your to your to your organization. So, yeah, that's that's a huge part, and that's why you know when people talk about mental health, it's there's a strategic business lens to it as to this connects to our value proposition to our employees to our customers. And organizations that bring all the way that, that through and are constantly doing this transformational dialogue of how do we do better? Because all of us can continue to raise our game, right? As individuals and as, as organizations, how do we raise our game? You know, we look at we look feedback, right? We have dialogue. We be humble about shit. <laughs> Sorry, we're allowed to swear. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Not child and, friendly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I'll, I'll watch, but yeah, probably my nieces and nephews are, are watching. So I'll, <laughs> don't say those words. Um, funny side story. My brother has nine kids. So uh, at least one of nine will probably uh, <laughs> listen. <laughs> that's Anyways. amazing. Uh, but I, I love how you kind of tied it into, cause that's where I wanted to, as you were talking, I'm, I'm just thinking a lot of times when companies are asking about um sorry am i just want to make sure i'm not picking up too much background noise okay um the sometimes creating a mentally healthy workplace is simply asking people how they're doing being open being curious and and i think as you are sort of painted that picture nicely when it when it starts to happen from top down and then bottom up and then it sort of becomes part of the culture, yeah. then the customer, in some sense, experiences the well-being of the organization, I guess, right? Totally, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Like it's, it's, you take, a lot of focus is done on customer profiles, right? And these uh -huh. personas of, of our customers, you know, the, the single mom or the, the father of two, and like, that's the persona, that's what we're gonna market to and brand to. Now flip that and say, okay, well, our employees, there's there's different personas of employees. So what's what matters to them, right? And so it's just taking these marketing techniques that we do to our customers, flipping them internally, and then making sure those things are, in, are aligned, right? And so when we think about our values and our language, what matters, it should show up throughout. And that creates consistency and uh, integrity, right, in an organization when those things are aligned. But a lot of organizations just look externally um, of those personas and what matters and what are we saying and it's so important in our brand because we want brand attraction, we want raving fans of our company, of our product and service. Well, don't you want raving fans of your employees too? 
because then they'll be raising fat, right? So, so it, it's just taking those marketing techniques, flipping them. I and mean, organizations are doing this, and, and, and some aren't yet, but hopefully they will. Like, maybe they'll listen to this and be like, yes, we agree, Sean. Uh, help us. <laughs> but but that's, that's a key piece, right? That's a key piece is actually then taking that lens and saying, okay, what matters to them? What are the different personas, a contact center rep, a frontline worker, a corporate worker, somebody in the warehouse? Uh, what does that experience look like? I'm a team lead. I'm a senior leader. Um, and then, and then going even one, and I'm going to challenge organizations to look at this, go beyond the employee, think about their family, think about their community. So what are you doing for that community? What are you doing for that family? What are those support, the benefits, other support pieces, education, or things that you can do for that family of that employee, the community of that employee, and whether that's supporting volunteer hours, you know, benefits for the family, um, care days when a family member's sick. There's several pieces of that because sometimes the employee's operating just great. They're, they're thriving in life. Maybe there's somebody in their family, in their network, in the community that's suffering. That's, that's taking their attention going, I, I want to support them, right? Maybe it's impacting their mental health by supporting somebody else and being a caregiver for somebody. So that's, that's the piece that's the next, and I think, I don't think a lot of organizations are doing it from my experience, but it is where organizations are starting to focus is you know, how do we light a fire under all of this to make sure that when we, an employee is part of this organization, they understand that we care about um, their family and about their community. And mm -hmm. that's huge. And I've seen, I worked for one large retailer that was doing a really good job with this. Um, and the, you know, the employee resource groups that they pulled together um, not talked about just the employee side, but they also talked about the customer demographic and what products they were doing. And so like, your employees are a beautiful, you know, community of human beings with talent. That if you unlock that um, and create the dialogue and the space of comfort to talk about your business and what you're doing, it's pretty incredible. So it's for me that's it drives me, I guess, to push these conversations um, because it matters, right? Down to the individual that's struggling, to a community that may be suffering, right? Um, that organizations, I think, can always continue to step up and do more, right, and do better. So, yeah, I, I'm curious how how is that being integrated into the accounting and the you sort of mentioned the profit and law, like the balance sheet versus the how maybe how if if you if you can paint that picture of. <laughs> what it was like in the past or, or how has this just grown to be something that companies are incorporating into and are they even really yeah i mean it's a mix right some are some some aren't uh it all depends on size organization and your leadership right, and right. you may have other pressures that are going on so if you're in an organization that's financially you know yeah, tons of liabilities and you're just really struggling you don't have a lot to invest um, doesn't mean you can't do anything. There's still some low cost, no cost stuff that you can do. So I think I always challenge organizations, even if they're um, struggling financially, um, still think about some things that they can do that are, you know, minimal investment to zero. There's still some, you're still humans. Um, but, yeah. but the impact that you can see is, is looking at it from, it's, I mean, it's really understanding the, the true P&L hard costs related to absenteeism, right, et cetera. Like there's actual dollars you can look at um, first is the, the non-monetary stuff um, that is around your talent attraction, brand engagement, so those pieces. But to me, it's the organizations that connect the the soft stuff versus the hard pieces. Um, it's it's really important because you can connect it to your PO in terms of your SGNA, like your uh, your your expenses uh, and the cost of wages and benefits. Um, and uh, and looking at that for sure. So that's that's how it shows up in PL is actually pulling in the different line items and saying, right. you know, whatever benefit that's been or in our what was uh, the hold on, I gotta I gotta stop you for the the S G and the A or something. Oh, uh, selling I yeah, selling general administration. So it's oh, uh, okay. What's that? Just all your expense lines and stuff like that. Okay, okay, so, okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So all your and, and, expenses below the profits right. and stuff. Yeah. Right, right. And yeah. and from your experience, maybe personal and also professional, like how maybe just what are some examples of how a situation where an employee's having a rough time or, or something goes on where yeah. 
traditionally it's kind of dealt with this way and now things or or at least what's an example of how things are being handled more effectively right good question so i think in the past it's been uh you know a lot of just deferring to a employee assistance program an eap or um, and so managers not knowing what to say or not wanting to say anything. So if something's somebody's struggling, they might know it's just like, here's an EAP uh, or hey, call so, HR. So yeah, yeah, like to get yeah. to, so, so I'm a yeah. manager. It's clear to me, employee A is not well. Yeah, they may notice something. And then, yeah. Okay, and then, so I either don't say anything or do you say something or whatnot, but so how would that, like, how does that employee find their way to the EAP? Does the manager say something? Do they send them an email? Do they contact EAP? Like, how does yeah, that work? There's, yeah, there's various ways. I mean, some organizations will obviously have it available on employee portals or in the lunchroom, they'll have um, signage and posters usually. Um, the managers and HR would have, you know, brochures or cards or can email, you know, the, the contact information. So again, some employees aren't talking to anybody about it. So they may just get it from employee communication channels uh, or see it in the lunchroom or whatnot. Um, if a manager, because not everybody exhibits signs that they're going through something, right? So for, for those that maybe a manager notices a shift in behavior or something, then they would generally just, you know, here's a EAP uh, number to call. You know, organizations will have the EAP provider come and do sometimes lunch and learns uh, for employees to kind of listen in and learn about you know, what's there. So that's kind of generally how it's been. Um, what's evolving though to your question is, is really giving um, more understanding of beyond EAP, what are the other services available that not everybody shows symptoms or signs that they're going, that they're struggling. So to how do we constantly make sure that we're talking about that these are the services available for you and your family, whether you, you know whether we see it or not. So it's got to be part of our dialogue of, of regular check-ins, right? Of, um, and so that's a continual you know, broadcast, I guess, of all the things we offer. So whether we see something or, or not, you know it's there as an individual, whether you're displaying symptoms of, of, of struggle or not you know it's there. And so um, that's that's a really you know low cost thing to do is to keep, you know, we would at one organization we were blasting out at least every few months, like all employees just here where and I would get letter, you know, an email from from people saying, you know, I wasn't even aware we had this. I'm going through something with my wife. Thank you for reminding me we had this and we're gonna we're gonna call. So I mean it it is just keeping those things uh, communicated. What's what's happening now though is more education around for managers of like how to how to create a safe space for those conversations to not make assumptions about everybody's home life um, and what they may be going through that um, that they actually start to look at ways of having those conversations and saying you know i don't need to know everything but know that i'm here for you um, that we do have these resources available uh, um, and you know you can talk to hr if you'd like but just being able to have richer a little bit richer conversation a bit of a script almost um, and that sometimes you don't have to have all the words it's actually just even today with all the virtual world, it's like a virtual, you know, coffee chat walk and just say, you know, I'm just, just want to hold space to chat. Let's not talk about work and, and whatnot. So it's creating, I guess, uh, different ways to engage with your team, um, how to have conversations or not just to hold space and that provide them those resources for, for what I do. I'm always sharing EAP plus, You've got other resources like Kids Help Phone. There's uh, you know Looking Glass for eating disorders. You've got um, you know Jack.org for for you. Like there's so many different organizations doing amazing work um, for mental health support um, uh, that it's it's so important, right? That we talk about the other resources that are available in our communities. And so I always want to share, and even globally, right? And so when I do global talks, we I tell managers like in your country, like these are the other numbers you can provide, uh, other resources that are available, you know, in your market, because every country is a little bit different in terms of the services. So it's going a little bit deeper in the conversation support, the resource support, and the constant reminder to our organization of the things we have to support people. So I mean, that's kind of the evolution from the, you know, here's the number kind of thing, so. Yeah, do you know, um, do... I guess I'm sure it totally varies, but <laughs> what's yeah. the use like? Do, 
from what I EAP. understand. Yeah, like I, I, I hear that yeah. they don't often get used very much. Oftentimes people complain or it's not oh, quite helpful because it's I quite worked, impersonal. I, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I've seen it all. So I've seen numbers as low as like four or 5%. Um, and I've seen numbers up to over 30% uh, utilization. So I've seen the variety um, on average, 70% is pretty average. Um, and uh, which means that there's a lot more that aren't using it still. Uh, the organizations that are in the you know, 30, 25, 30%, uh, credit unions uh, are an industry where it has a higher utilization of EAP. Um, so I've, I've worked for two different credit unions. Um, so just the culture of, of credit unions, um, the it's just part of part of with in a credit union environment, um, there is just a real sense of self and honesty to talk about things. Like and and it's really a beautiful thing. Um, if they haven't worked in a credit unions. They're amazing cooperatives and the values. And so that really permeates in um, the inclusion efforts and support for mental health. And so, um, so that stands out versus I've worked in industries where very low, uh, more maybe male dominated, industrial, um, yeah, call yeah. so it's in those spaces you're seeing, you know, there's just a stigma, more stigma, I guess, with it. And so we had to use different tactics to try and um, you know, provide support and understand what's available. But, um, but it, yeah, it does vary by industry and, and the demographic shifts uh, for sure, so. Do you think that it's, sometimes I, I don't think people ask this question enough and whether the answer is straightforward or not. Is the workplace even the right environment to be cracking open these conversations? And I think, Maybe some workplaces, yes, some no, some more so, some less so. Um, yeah. So there's that question. And then also, if yes, I would imagine, then the traditional, which I think in most situations, the answer would be yes. Like it is important to keep opening up as much as uh, mm -hmm. can be managed. Yeah. So if that is a yes, then... To me, it seems that the traditional EAP system, benefit system, mm -hmm. is not set up to serve that, right? Because if right. we're if we're expecting more openness internally, then what's the point in having an EAP in some ways? Like I or, or yeah. maybe it just it needs to be reimagined or something. To totally. And that's kind of what um, I think it's you're hitting it the nail on the head because it's so yes, it's the right place, but it's how we do it, right? And so the the, the tools and the tactics uh, okay. yeah, yeah, need yeah. to be. And so I've I've created this change one life kind of four pillar approach to mental health in the workplace based on my experience leading you know benefits, wellness uh, and disability teams for years. Um, is one, the first pillar is all around kind of the awareness, right? Reducing stigma, right? So we need to make sure we're, you know, bringing stories to life, we're talking about stuff. There's the training aspect for, ex you know, executives, leaders, uh, you know, frontline staff, man you know, employees, so the training aspect of what is, what is mental illness versus mental health and the terminology and where do I go for help? So there's a training aspect. How do I support others? Um, and my, you know, those kind of things. So the training, awareness training. Um, executive sponsorship. So the, the, the third pillar around spawn is it really, do your executives, the C-suites, right? Do they, do they understand um, why this is important? Do they support it? Are they putting resources behind this? Are they investing in the strategy and the business case for this? Because um, why are we doing it? Who's involved? How does this impact the, the PNL? How does it impact our brand? Um, those kind of things. Like you've got to stand these things up as a true business case and with a, with a bit of a project charter of, of this is this is why we're doing it because it it doesn't get you know one training session you're done one EAP number you're done, so the sponsorship's really important. And so I've done work we've had like you know leadership uh, meetings and bringing the metrics you know that really can, we can use as a benchmark to see when we do all these activities are we seeing a shift in uh, absenteeism um, the, the durations of short term leaves related to mental health um, et cetera like there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can pull in utilization for EAP is it's just a piece of it. Um, and then this last piece, these kind of results, uh, integration with all your policies and programs is EAP is just one piece, right? Because it, it could be just more of a preventative reactionary, it's, it's for short-term counseling support. 
But then you have to look at all those other pieces, right? So organizations are looking at, you know, my, you know supporting mindfulness apps or apps to provide people uh, from cognitive behavioral therapy to just additional resources and tools for everyday living and, and improving your mental health, right? And so it's having access to all those resources to before even people even call the EAP, right? It's it's preventative, right? So when something is a trickle versus a waterfall, right? And so it's it's having these kind of pieces to your mental health solution and programs that um, talks about things all the way through from preventative care, right? To there's a short-term counseling need to longer-term illness and care. And so how can we get people back to work at some point, right? So that return to work and accommodations and all those kind of things. And, and so for me, um, EAP is just a one piece of the whole, um, you know, puzzle, right, and solution. And so when we look at it, it's making sure we look at, you know, diversity inclusion activities, your ERG groups, and how are those set up? Um, and then we look at your benefits provider, your disability provider, what are they doing, et cetera. So, Wait, what's an ERG? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's the employee resource group. So Okay, cool. Are, okay. Yeah, and they might talk about, uh, might be for women or uh, right, right, LGBTQ right. or mental, you might do a disability, um, right. uh, whether it's uh, visible or invisible. So there's lots of in the ERG space. Right. Um, but it's, it's really the integration, all those pieces. So for me, that's what we're working with organizations now is saying, okay, we can help with training, right, for employees and managers. We can maybe do a project plan and a business case for your leaders, get some sponsorship, right? And, and really understand the metrics around this. And then this last pillar where all the heavy lifting happens is, okay, well, what are all the programs and policies that impact mental health? Um, it could be your sick day program or care days. It could be right, all these things I just mentioned. And then building a plan to actually say, okay, well, what do we do first? What's gonna have the biggest bang for our buck, right? So. And you read these studies from Deloitte and a few others that have done for every dollar you put into mental health and wellness, you might get a buck 62 or two bucks or three bucks, but it's going to take time. It's a multi-year investment. It's changing the way you do business, the way you show up for people. Um, so you, so there is an ROI, but you need to do it right. You need to do it thoughtfully. Um, you got to have the right, right resources for uh, as a team because HR teams are also struggling with trying to get everything done too. You know, hire people and they got to do the help support pay changes and you know there's exits and there's so much work engagements like there's so much happening in HR um, to stand up and do beyond just mental health training requires looking at your resourcing and that's that's an important part is is um, there's a lot of great strategy work but to actually implement it deploy it make it work and then almost package it to say you know we're going to do this these things work together, then we're gonna change these policies, we're gonna roll that out. Oh, we gotta to talk to the union first to make sure they're okay with these shifts because it's actually we gotta negotiate that into the contract. Like every organization is gonna be a little bit different of their starting point, but we need to clear what their vision is. And so that's where um, you know we're excited to work with organizations that we're building that kind of that plan out and then helping them because they may not have the, you know, I'm almost like a director of comp and benefits on speed dial. <laughs> so it's like, you know, you need an extra <laughs> pair of hands to call me and then we'll, we'll help build the plan and, and, and then help you um, get things over the line. So you can start to realize your investment. So, right. and help you. I, I mean, so. Yeah. I mean, that, that is, it seems to me that I'm going to go a little bit out in left <laughs> field and then try to bring it back, but I remember in economics class in university, intro to economics, micro, macro, bubble, you know, all that kind of as we're, <laughs> and, you know, they, in the textbook, it, it shows an equation. This is how the economy works. You know, it's like people, <laughs> uh, industry, the environment, yeah. and it's just like this simple little uh, whatever diagram. Um, and then it seems that we just sort of take these givens as givens and for granted, this is just how mm -hmm. things are. Um, right. So I think part of maybe, maybe it's total uh, naivete on my part, but I, I hear and I see things happening. And, and again, again, Elon Musk is an amazing example where he was just like, screw all the traditional ways of doing things. I mean, and maybe he didn't screw all of them, but he kind of says, Let's lead with imagination, creativity, yeah. etc. Yeah. Um, and then he had the guts and the 
I mean, the amount of stress he probably went through over the years where it wasn't really working out uh, to stick with it. Um, So how can we, because I think as a, as a global civilization, but uh, I'd say also uh, our Western sort of democratic capitalist economies. Yeah. Uh, we need to, well, it, I think there's a lot of potential in reimagining what that equation for growth is, you know? So it's maybe we can insert human metrics in there that could change everything dramatically. Um, and then, so there's that piece and then connecting that to what you were saying in terms of uh, the daily commitment to practicing and carrying out the values or the ideals. And then the last layer is, of course, <laughs> as an individual, right? Yeah. And you know this too, when we're not well, if we're not committed to doing the things we know we need to do to become well and then stay well and thrive mm-hmm. yeah. um, consistently <laughs> and never stop, right? Because it's sort of a health promotion thing. Uh, yeah. That takes a lot of commitment and it's hard. And so sometimes yeah. I see, I think that's a yeah. big gap is, is organizations. It's very much an example of a human, like one person who knows they want to do something, knows they want to change, but they're just totally disconnected from the reality of what that actually will take on a daily basis. <sighs> okay, that was a lot. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, <laughs> but you know, it's, I think there's there's pieces of that, like, so I, you know, we talk about the equation and, and shifting the paradigm, right? I think it is, and we're seeing it now with the pandemic is that what we believe to be true, right? In terms uh-huh, of, you uh-huh. know, this means this, has yeah. completely these, you know, people would have five year, seven year plans of the future workforce and, you yeah. know, hybrid work from home and, and in office, those seven year plans are now seven month plans. <laughs> right, um, right. So, <laughs> so, you know, the silver lining or, or however we want to call it of, of the pandemic, yes, we have more awareness of uh, and talking about mental health. We are challenging these assumptions around when we will do certain things as organizations and when we'll, well, you know what? It's now, and so it's amazing. I think organizations are starting. To go, wow, we were able to um, move things faster. You know, drop the assumptions about when we were going to do stuff. Um, talk to our employees differently. And again, it's it's some have innovated on their own products and services and saying, you know what? How can we stay relevant and still bring in money to keep our employees and leverage whatever service or technology we have? Um, there was one I was Simon Sinek talking about a pizza. Um, like a, they were, they made pizza, pizza restaurant, right? And they, you know, you know, obviously with the pandemic, they used their brick ovens to m- melt this plastic to turn into face shields. They were just like, you know what, we can, we have hot enough ovens to actually take this plastic and mold it to face shields during the pandemic because, you know, sales are down. And so we can, like, it was just like super innovative, right? You, and so not everybody's doing that, but the fact that you're saying, huh, how can I, keep people employed, leverage the tools and things they have. And I love that example that he said, because it is those that are, you know, getting the e-commerce thing, home delivery or pushing, um, but it's hard. Like there are folks that are still unemployed, right? Unemployment rates are really high. So I think the, your, your question around, you know, assumptions around the formula, around economics, and, yeah, I mean, it's always about supply and demand, but what's shifting is the demands of the consumer um, the organizational setups and paradigms we've created are shifting quickly. And so that's then translated into, okay, so how do I, the new, I mean, a lot, not everybody's, there's a lot of essential workers that are still going into offices and hospitals and grocery stores, but there's still, there's, there's a lot of people that the new office is at home. So then how do I ensure what's my account, what's my responsibility as an employer uh, to inquire about the safety of that setup and like, you know, like it's, it's just changing the dialogue because it's not just once in a while working from home for a few people. So right. then it's taking it to the human question of that to shift behavior to, for ourselves, we are not robots, we are human. Um, you know, I, I did the Tony Robbins thing a couple of years ago. I've gone through a few of his events and it's, it, and the biggest pieces, and he would, he would even say it himself. He goes, I'm still learning. <laughs> you know, there's days I slip up. I don't, you know, do my yoga every day or whatever, but you know, we understand that these little habits, we start to shift 
um, little habits, it can become an aligning to our bigger goals um, does start to shift the results, right? And so this formula of mindset behavior results that, that I talk to in a lot of my talks is why does it matter to you to get quiet and mindfulness and really understanding our thoughts um, can, will shift. If our mindset starts to get clear and more positive, we start to get calmer, that shifts our behaviors or what we do, say, how we feel ourselves. We're going to go to the gym today or go for a walk or call somebody, whatever that is. And the result being our mental health, right? In terms of how we feel. So positive or negative. So so mindset behavior results is and really coming from the fact that we've got to think about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Is it serving us or not? And so for organizations, looking at the human aspect of our people is going, having honest conversations about, you know, this is, this is as leaders, you know, I've, I've, I've had tough days. I share that with my teams. Like, this is where I found my resilience, you know, and you know, I even talked to my mom, you know, I interviewed her for a, a woman's uh, ERG group. Um, and I said, you know, how, how would you talk to 150 women around the world about resiliency and self-care? And she says, well, she goes, I think about, you know, she was uh, two careers, you know, a, a nurse and then a teacher, two boys, me and my brother, uh, elder care for both her parents, you know, she's gone through a lot. Um, and and but been amazing at that. And, uh, but she said, she thinks about the times when she was most successful and resilient and so proud of and she thinks about her that you know that that mom you know, Sharon I'm Sharon um, she thinks about her when she's you know having a tougher day right and so she knows that she can fight through anything and so I think it is important to that it's we are we're human and we find those daily habits to allow ourselves to to be humble and real and honest, um, find those outlets, those people that we can support with organizations providing those resources in a way that's anonymous and available at any time that you need it to prevent stuff, to deal with things when it's a trickle versus a waterfall becomes a bigger issue. Um, and then that starts to the support systems and those things start to evolve. And that's really, you know, what I see is where organizations are and are starting to evolve is the paradigm changing, the human connection, and understandings getting deeper, the neuroscience of this whole thing. And then how do we actually operationalize this in the new way of just doing it, not just a training course. And that's that's kind of to bring your kind of comments through. I think that's how I would, you know, kind of frame it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah wow. Um, <laughs> I can nerd no, on this cool. all day. I love this yeah, topic. Me <laughs> too. Yeah. <laughs> so, me too. Yeah. I do yeah. love, and it's nice to kind of be able to layer my map or perception of it onto yours or hearing you because you have such a different well you have much more experience and understanding of the intricacies of it playing out um i'm just looking at the clock too and, and uh, <laughs> my wife my wife hasn't let me know if the, i can hear <laughs> the person upstairs anyway um i want to kind of there's one thing definitely I kind of wanted you to explain because I really like the way you speak to it. Um, sure. I, and it is a part of what you were just saying in terms of just the the conversations that go on inside. And yeah. I think this actually connects with my two questions is, okay. uh, the, so the, there's a tremendous, obviously importance of having those honest, sincere conversations. Yeah. And I can't remember exactly how you framed it, but it was about the intention kind of not assuming other people's intentions or something like that uh, in that uh, session you ran that I, for the huddle, you talked yeah. really nicely to that. And then do you think, because I definitely do, that's my bias. I'm just <laughs> call it out right there. There's my bias that sort of this, our, 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 pendulum swing into the world of political correctness mm -hmm. is is actually making it very difficult for people to feel safe which is so weird because the assumed intention of the political correctness is to make things safe for people but yeah. i think it's actually having it's i think it's gone a bit too far and it's having the reverse consequence so i'm just kind of curious what you even think about that if you would disagree <laughs> Because obviously a lot of people do would disagree, um, and yeah, and how that may or may not relate to the intentions piece, and also to to really 
living out these ideals of having more open, honest, sincere yeah. conversations? Yeah. Great question. To <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I think it's it's more than a yes no. I think for me, it's about um, sometimes the, in, in any kind of transformation in life um, and evolution, there's always going to be sometimes a, a pendulum swing that might go a little bit far, and then you kind of come back into a rest of of what normal. So we needed to, we needed to, to push, right? So we needed to push. It was just getting ridiculous, and we're still seeing Agreed. BS yeah. Uh, yeah. happening. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like even this week, right? For sure. So yeah, so we have to push, right? And sometimes yeah. it's gonna be highlighted in a high vibration because the world needs to freaking hear it. Yeah. Honestly, I'm shaking as I say it. Because yeah, it no, no. Uh, yeah. And so and I what happens is that you actually too. then yeah. open the dialogue from that, right? Yeah. And so the dialogue is gonna to shift to where we need to end up. But at the end of the day, because we all need to feel safe, we need to feel included. But what's happening, and I've talked to other HR professionals uh, around this topic is, have we created um, some, you know, especially talk about employee resource groups is, there, is a great example, right? They've been around for many years, it's becoming more on trend to have them, but then you start creating almost silos. Like we have an ERG for this group and an ERG for this group. And people are like, I identify with like four of them. How can I go to all four? And so sometimes we, to try and create inclusivity and we're trying, we create these silos themselves. And so I think it's good to say, you know what, maybe it's just two groups or maybe it's just one, right? Why can't we all? And so I'll, I'll leave you with this. I think that, you know, one of my uh, good HR kind of mentors, I would say, I've known her for years, she, she was on her way to an inclusion diversity conference. And her daughter, who's like, who was probably six or seven at the time, very smart young girl, she goes, why do you even need to go to that, mom? Shouldn't we just always be inclusive and diverse and value people's opinions? Like, why do you need a conference on that? And that moment, when I heard that story, it goes, the child's eye, the innocence of that is true. That sometimes we've, we've created these things as adults and through whatever you know, history has, has served us. But if you think of things through the lens of a child, it's a lot simpler, right? So, but yes, we need to learn about this stuff and take these pieces, but it should just be the way we are, the way we operate. And so there's these you hear a few articles around well hr is just the diversity inclusion team isn't it like shouldn't all of hr be looking you know whether how you hire people how you promote people how you support people should have you know think of it from a dni perspective think of it from a mental health perspective and just be a good freaking you know function of the, of the company that so versus creating these like silos within hr you're the mental yeah, health yeah. person you're the dni person all of us are a part of it. So we need to lead the strategy. We need those roles, but things are evolving. And so that's where I think we've gone here. And then we're, we're just, we're all vibrating. Going, well, yeah, 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 we all have opinions, great. But it's the right conversations because it's good to have different opinions. That's how we improve and get it to the right balance. Um, and people are afraid of challenging um, some of these because like, oh, I can't say I don't agree with that or disagree with that. It's okay, it's how you say it and saying, well, help me understand. I'm curious about, right? So the thing about assumptions, curiosity, that's the biggest thing is don't make assumptions of why somebody feels a certain way or says something. Be curious. Help me understand is the most powerful statement. Help me understand. Um, I was thinking this, like, versus, you know, well, you're wrong. I'm right. It's like, you know, so the language matters and how we dialogue about it matters. And I think that's how I would, you know, frame that part of it. So. Yeah, no, that's a, that, thank you. That's helpful. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think the, yeah, it really is a good one. And, and as you also mentioned, necessary overdue. Um, yeah, I, I think it also, even myself, when I get hooked or stuck, kind of in my own I don't know a story of of what's going on yeah um the reminder of it's really i think how we engage in the discussion that matters and and being that curious stance is, is and help me understand that humility is huge um i do think it needs to be uh also held with a stance that I'm not just going to agree to everything you say. Like, it's okay for me to hear you out and yeah. also still disagree, but it's how that's done totally. that it's actually quite difficult a lot of times. But, um, and so that's where we're at, I guess, trying to learn that 
and and I do think you also reminded me of I think the fact that the pendulum has had to kind of push so much is a is in some sense a condemnation to the lack of traditional way of doing things of yeah. like hello like it's about fucking time you know and and had had that happened more openly and willingly the pendulum yeah. wouldn't have had to go so far and it wouldn't be so disruptive in some sense yeah ex exactly yeah. yeah and you can look at it from many perspectives from women's rights to lgbtq you yeah. know and indigenous peoples like like there's yeah. so many it's yeah like uh, i mean i I can go yeah. on about it, but I won't. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's it's the story is so it matters around the history and yeah. recognizing that, acknowledging, it, and then knowing that we can have different opinions about some things. But yeah, we can have a conversation, look at it together versus at each other. And I think that's yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. it's healthy then. Say, what are we gonna do about it then? Right. So yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Here we are. Yeah. Here wow, we are. Cool. Here we are. We're to yeah. <laughs> <Let's> do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Cool. Well, thank you, Sean. I know it's our time's kind of rolling up and thank you. I, I just amazing. I, I'm blessed to have people <laughs> like you who are willing to do this and share your wisdom. So thank you. Yeah. Th thanks for creating the forum and all the work you do as well. And uh, yeah. thanks for having me on today. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Just an important topic and look forward to continuing to work with you. So yeah, likewise. All right, man. Cool. I'm going to run upstairs and rescue my wife and uh, okay. not get in trouble. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Um, okay. Till next time, man. Okay. Take care. Bye. Thanks a lot, Sean. Okay. Bye. Thank you.